Andrew Claudio, Nick's Film School. It was great bumping to you in Vegas, man. How are things? It's good. Uh, things are awesome at the moment because we're officially in the off season. it feels like. So things have settled down a bit. And yeah, Andrew, it was great to bump into you in Vegas as well. How have you been? I'm doing well. It's awesome to be a Knicks fan these days, right? It is, I'll say. But yeah. best, best it's been in a long time. Uh, consistently been, I should say. For sure. All right. I mean, it's all about the center position. And Precious just signed a one-year $6 million deal. Um, but before we get there, what is your thought on the Vucevic buzz to New York? I got to be honest, you're notifying me of the Vucevic really? buzz to New York. I hadn't heard really? anything legitimate. Yeah, so, so, the so thing please is, tell is, me. Yeah, so they want to land a top center, obviously. And there's a good chance um, – that it won't be before the season, but it could be during the season. And people are talking Mitch and Miles to the Bulls for Vucevic. Um, it doesn't really change the depth because Precious is now there and it'll be a swipe for Mitch for Vucevic. Uh, McBride would be in it. Um, yeah, that's really what I'm hearing, but I don't think it'll happen before the season starts. I'd have to look at the money because it's just like the world that we live in now with the second first and second apron. Um, I'm assuming that means more money is going out because I don't think the Knicks want to hard cap themselves at the first apron. Mm -hmm. If you're just asking from a basketball standpoint, I've never been the biggest uh, Vucevic fan. Mm, um, okay. I, special, I just the Knicks are so built on rim protection like the, and offensive rebounding. And that's just the opposite of what Vooch is. He's a, he's a guy who spaces the floor. The reason that the Bulls were so effective in any rebounding lineups last year is because they had to play him with Andre Drummond. So I would prefer if you're going to go get a center that you, especially if it's one that's going to cost you deuce, um, I would prefer you go get someone with a little more upside. Maybe Look, the Walker-Kessler thing has always been the thing oh, I yeah. go back to, that if... Danny Ainge comes back to reality is willing to make a fair, fair trade for both sides, which I don't think he is uh, that Walker Kessler for Deuce and whatever pick the Knicks are able to still give up is the, the deal I'd be willing to make or Danny would like Ainge, the Knicks to make Danny Ainge wants 29 first round draft picks. That's the and problem. And your firstborn and the, <laughs> the dear house and your car and any film rights that you have on your life. He wants 10%. So. Yeah, I mean, the thing with Vucevic is it would be an upgrade offensively and he will be there's it's more likely he'll be available. That's the other thing with Mitch. Like, that's only my my only concern with Mitch. Like, if you want that to be your starting, if you want him to be your starting center, there's always like the concern. Will he be there the whole season? Well, let me ask you, because I respect your your basketball. eye. how many more offensive upgrades do the Knicks need? Knicks need? That's you fair. Know? That's fair. But, you know, it's just look at the Celtics, right? Like everybody could make a three. Everybody could almost score at all three levels. It's like almost a new era in basketball where you just need all the offense you could get. I, I think the Knicks are, look, we, we've heard the, this said a lot. I think the Knicks are built in a factory to give the Celtics hell. Uh, yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. I and agree I think with that. their, their most optimal lineup, if they ever wanted to go to this. And I think Tibbs would, is with Randall at the four and OG at the five with Randall playing like as a hub, like Hartenstein on the offensive side. So that, that gives you your stretch five. If you'd like to is OG and Anobi's your five. And then you put DiVincenzo and uh, it, him or McBride and then Mikael Bridges and then Brunson. Like there are ways to get around it where Randall, despite not being not, not being like the greatest three point shooter still attracts the gravity and yeah you know, creates catch and shoot opportunities for just about everybody. Um, so that's, look, I, I agree with you. It's an offensive upgrade. I think the defensive downgrade that it would be is just too detrimental for my liking. And that's just my personal taste with, with Vooch. I've never been a fan. So. So with Julius, you mentioned Julius. How do you feel about his fit with the Nova Knicks? I mean, I want to see it. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. I, I'm optimistic about it. Uh, it's funny. We spent most of last season any anybody that was defending Julius Randle because there's just a, a mistrust that exists between him and the fan base because of his performance in the postseason. I think nationally there is an earned distrust with Julius Randle that we don't know what you are when the games matter the most. This isn't a good stats, bad team guy. They win a lot with Julius Randle on the floor during yeah. the regular season. 
he has just not shown he can perform not even just like at the highest level, just like at any level in his three playoff series so far. I look at context and I, I have my excuses ready. That first one, they the, the, the Hawks just geared up to stop one person and they knew that the house of cards would fall and it did. The second and third one, he hurt his ankle three weeks earlier. And then in game five of that, that Cavs series, he hurt it again and it was just never 100% for any of that playoffs. So I, I go into this, this new version with an open mind, understanding this is the most spacing he's ever played with with the Knicks. It's the best collection of talent he's ever played with with the Knicks. And there's a world world where... If he attracts a double team, he's got pick a 40% shooter on the wing for him to go to. If you're playing a one-on-one, this is a guy that loves to get downhill and play bully ball. Um, yeah. So I, I think there's there's a chance he you know, could average his career high in assists this year, and they could be really good. Unfortunately, the way the Knicks are constructed now by making the all-in move, there is a playoff question that he is going to have to answer. And I'm not shying away from it. I'm just, I'm open to the fact that he could answer it in the affirmative, which I don't think every Knicks fan agrees with me there. So I was talking to a very smart basketball friend and he wouldn't want me to say his name on the pod. So I won't say his name on the pod, but he told me the Knicks backup center is right in front of their face. And I'm like, who he's like Julius Randall. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that is, I never thought of that, mm-hmm. but that is kind of genius. Like, yep. I'm, I'm like, why couldn't I thought, why couldn't I have thought of that? Like, I don't know. Like it, it just makes so much sense in a lot of different ways. Your friend and I have had the same thought because I was talking wow. to our, our mutual friend CP. Yes. Uh, and I, I said CP. this a, a few different times uh, the, throughout the, the three weeks leading when the Knicks were looking for a backup center. Uh, if you, like Julius, I don't necessarily think is a rim protector or really a five. But if you change the thinking, especially on the defensive end, that those lineups are Randall at the five and you switch them to their Ananobi at the five on defense, their Randall at the five on offense. I don't know many senders that can guard Julius, especially if 100%. he brings them away from the rim. And I watched... Uh, OG Ananobi guard Joel Embiid effectively in the playoffs, specifically at the end of game four against the Sixers. And I mean, people go watch the last seven possessions of that game and Embiid did not know what to do when either Precious or Ananobi were guarding him. So I, I think that is a, a smart thought that your friend had. And I look, I compared it to the uh, understanding that the Knicks don't have Steph Curry. But we all remember the death lineup that the Warriors had before Kevin Durant, right? And it was kind of discovered by accident. It's because David Lee got hurt that Steve Kerr was like, well, what if right. I just put Iguodala out there at the floor? It, it was crazy because David Lee was one of their best players, right? And then it just something even better happened. It was amazing. It was like, okay, yeah. so I'm going to put Harrison Barnes at the three, Iggy at the four, Draymond at the five. Mm-hmm. And it, it it's not even like, I, I think, I don't know how you feel, but I thought like he played it all the time. Like it was one of those things that he played for the majority. <laughs> I see what of you're games. saying. Yeah. That first year he only played it 347 possessions. And right. then he only pivoted to it as a starting five when they went down two one in the finals. And he just like got rid of Andrew Bogut forever. Like just banished him to the end of the bench. Then yeah. the following season, he used it a ton, but newsflash every lineup the Warriors had in 2015, 16, when they went 73 and nine, was gangbusters. And then I didn't even realize this until looking into, at some cleaning the glass data. It got outscored in the playoffs. It wasn't like an effective lineup. And it's because teams just decided to, to load up and try to beat you on the boards. And Harrison Bards went cold. They then adjusted what maybe the greatest adjustment of all time. And it's add Kevin Durant. And it became the most unstoppable thing I've ever seen on a basketball court. Um, I'm not saying the Knicks have that. What I'm saying is they have their own version of it. If Ananobi's your uh, and with Ananobi Randall as your four or five in some order, yeah, Mikael Bridges, DiVincenzo, and Jalen Brunson. Yeah, I mean, I think it's a genius idea to have Julius Randall off the bench, but I don't know how he would take that. I don't off the I don't, bench. Yeah. Oh wow! I don't. Oh, that's what the the your friend was saying that he should be coming off the bench to. Okay, we had a very different thought. Me and your friend. Yeah. Then. J- Julius yeah. Randall's not coming off the bench, unfortunately. But how do you feel about that? They need a backup center. 
He doesn't really fit the identity in the playoffs with that starting five. He's an absolute bucket getter. They will not be able to get a better player in free in a trade, in a free agency, in any kind of way than Julius Randle as your sixth man. I don't think Julius Randle is coming <laughs> off the bench. Okay, let's say if he bought in. What, what, what if he bought in? Uh, yeah, this this world where he... So is DiVincenzo your starter? I think so, yeah. So Josh Hart... See, the, the issue is then Josh Hart, for me, is a Julius Randle replacement in mm. the the starting five. Well, just like as a backup. like Right, right. You're putting in Josh Hart to be a guy that can get boards, to play off of Mikel and uh, uh, Ananobi and Brunson and like the, the probably the most frustrating parts of Tibbs is when he just like sends spacing out the, out the window and is like, well, look at all the rebounding I can get. It's like, yeah, but your first shot being efficient, isn't a bad thing. Um, And I, other than the playoffs, Josh Hart is just not like the most effective three point shooter. So I think the, yeah, he made some crazy. He was making some crazy ones against Philly, man. He was knocking the, shots down. The guy did not hit four threes in a game once this season. He hit it in four different games against the Sixers. So he yeah. turned into Clay Thompson. And look, that yeah. was the game plan for Philly. They were like, we're just going to yeah. leave Josh Hart open. And by game four, Nick Nurse was like, I guess we're done leaving Josh Hart open because all he's doing is hitting threes. Um, I don't necessarily like I do agree with you in a perfect world. Julius Randle volunteering to or buying in to come off the bench is like is awesome. The problem is that you then put him in these lineups with Josh Hart that just don't have a ton of spacing. If he's on the court with Mitch and Josh Hart, then you're putting three non shooters on the floor. Oh yeah, I think Mitch would be out at that point, right? Like he comes well, in so for Well, so that's Mitch. if you're if you're hockey rotate rotating yeah, it where yeah. one has to be on for the other. I'm saying stagger. Like Yeah, yeah. If Julius is your starting five, he comes out and then when he comes back in, he plays with Ananobi as your center. Right. Like yeah. that's that's more what I'm I'm suggesting. It's like even if he plays with Precious, that's also not like a, a second unit that I want to put out there like with Josh Hart Julius Randle and Precious. They'll lead the league in offensive rebounding as a second unit, but yeah. there would be a lot of offensive rebound opportunities because they're missing they're, they're not the 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 most efficient offense, you know? Right. You you mentioned Precious and we kind of let off with him and I think it's a great deal for the Knicks, right? Like I didn't really like what he was doing with Toronto or even with Miami. I didn't think the decision making was great, but you know, there was months with the Knicks where he was averaging 12 points, he was playing really smart and to have him sign for $6 million, I mean, I think it's awesome for the Dicks, especially at a position that they really need. They needed a backup five that they could trust. And especially yeah. with Mitchell Robinson being your new starting five. Right. Uh, I just, this is no disrespect to Mitch. I, I think he is elite when he, at what he's good at when he plays, he just hasn't proven he could stay on the court at, as much. So you needed someone that knows the team, knows the coach, knows the system. And Preston Chua showed he could do that last year. Um, are there limitations to his game? Yes. I don't necessarily putting him next to a rim running center or really just like a, a dunker spot center uh, leads to the best offense. Um, some of the worst moments the Knicks had last year was when he was playing the four. And really what, once teams figured out, just ignore Preston Right. And right. it led to some, some really clunky offense. But from a rerouting perspective, he just took advantage of teams and like bully ball teams a lot during the regular season. And there were moments, like I mentioned the Philly game when he played next to Ananobi in crunch when Mitch, Mitch Robinson missed uh, game four. And like he played down the stretch for Isaiah Hartenstein and earned those minutes. I thought, I thought it was the right call by Tom Thibodeau to, to go to precious and Ananobi down the stretch. And yeah, I I think he's he's exactly the center that as the the available list of players list dwindled down. It was like I just signed Precious, and we'll readdress this if we need to later in the season. So you're okay with the center depth chart as of now? As of now, yes. Especially okay. since I have illusions of grandeur of Tibbs playing Ananobi at the five. Okay, okay. Uh, CP actually said it best. I was listening listening to him talk about the Brunson extension. Mm -hmm. um, and he basically said, which I totally agree with, that he extended his honeymoon period. Like, if he would have signed some huge deal, there would have been more pressure. But on the other side of things, like, 
he did leave a lot of money on the table, right? Or didn't he? Is there some back end stuff going on? Like, like, what are your thoughts on all of it? So, look, the, the, as far as the honeymoon period is concerned, uh, it's him, it's Aaron Judge. End of list for the ho- most important and most beloved athletes in this city. And Aaron I mean, Judge is—he he was already beloved, and after this, it's going right, to be ridiculous. But- yeah. The level that he's now ascended to, like 100%. I'm talking about, like the captain of the Yankees, and then there's this right. this guard that right, was right. it was drafted in the second round, and what he's ascended to, um, he just his Q rating here in the Big Apple is yeah, ridiculous. The biggest that I can remember for a Nick, and like you see a Carmelo Anthony jersey over my shoulder, he's ascended. Mello in levels that Mello, Mello never had a had a chance of approaching, and I got to be honest, like I thought about this during the playoffs, and now you add in the extension. But the Brunson Patrick Ewing conversation is going to come really quick, especially as this team experiences more playoff success. And I don't, I don't know if a lot of us that experienced the '90s are ready to have it because it might become undeniable, and it might be in favor of Jalen Brunson. He got to win a know? championship though, because. He does. Patrick but- Ewing carried a franchise for years and years and years. So that, that's a tough one. That's a tough one. But if Brunson's the cog that turns around a franchise that is part of the most sustainable era of success that they've had since the 90s. And look, he wins a chip, then it's not even a conversation. But like Ewing didn't win one. And in the one finals he did play in, like he, he went head to head with Hakeem, who just proved to be a better player. Fine. Like, if it ends up that neither of them win a finals and they both make the playoffs for like seven, eight straight years and they make the finals each once, like, I, it becomes a conversation, is all I'm saying. And look, it's it, a lot of like, I'm a Mets fan, so I can't speak to this, but I, I, a lot of the Yankee fans that are also Knicks fans in my life have been able to speak to this. Like, we have our Derek Jeter. We have our guy that, you know, sacrifices for the team, does what's best for the team and is all about winning. And I I just I never got to root for a Derek Jeter again. I'm a Mets fan. And so it's really cool to see what he's what he's his reputation and what he's he's really earned himself uh, by both with his play and now with this gift that he's given the Knicks by giving them a lot more flexibility as far as the whether or not he gave up a ton, I think they're going to take care of him with his next contract. I'm also just not ignorant to the fact that his godfather is the president of basketball of operations of the Knicks, that his agent is the son of said president of basketball operations of the Knicks, that the Knicks went out and got all of his friends from college to play for the team. Uh, So there are perks that come with playing in that ecosystem that I'm sure he's going to take advantage of. Yeah, it's full Nova Knicks without Jay Wright, though. They don't have Jay Wright. Yeah. Tib signed the extension. What are your thoughts That's on that? Uh, what, what, what I, I really like, I actually like the way Jay Wright coaches better than Tibbs, but that's a whole other conversation for another day. Uh, maybe it's not a whole other conversation for another day. Like, I, he was playing four out offense before anybody else was. And I don't know, man. I just love the way Jay Wright coaches, but it doesn't look like that's going to happen anytime soon. Well, so it depends who you talk to about Jay Wright. He sounds very retired. Like, yes, uh, no interest said, in coaching to, at the next to, level. Totally, ha- totally happy w- with what we're doing right now. Talking basketball. Right. So <laughs> that's the, the thing that I don't, like consulting free ticket to every Nova Knicks game. Fine. Uh, look, Tom Thibodeau, the job that he's done with the Knicks is not equally as essential to the job Jalen Brunson's done in helping in the turnaround. But the turnaround doesn't start with Jalen Brunson. It starts with Tom Thibodeau as far as the Knicks return to competency. Yeah. And look, I, I've seen a lot of bad coaches in my time, and I know what it's like to watch a basketball team that doesn't care. And the one thing about Knicks teams under Tom Thibodeau, even with like clunky offensive things that I just quibbled with during our during our conversation, right? The team cares. Like I I heard uh the pod father, Mr. Bill Simmons, say mm-hmm. at one point when analyzing one of the Knicks series that like they win games by just trying harder. Like that's he's the body language like, expert too. He's been talking right, about this so, for years. So like looking at the <laughs> Knicks body language down 20, they're still trying down 40. They're still trying. And there were so many games last year where they're just so far out talented because the injuries were piling up 
but they're still trying. And it's like they have no business being in this game against you name the team. And they're down four with five minutes left. And that was a team we all became so proud of. And I, I, I would love for the Knicks to eventually, you know, get over the hump and make it to a finals, win a finals with him, uh, a basketball lifer that I think has brought a lot to the game defensively and brought a lot to this franchise. And, you know, like it's on the record, like Fred Katz has reported this, uh, that one of the reasons Jalen Brunson signed here when he did was because he wanted to play for, for Tom Thibodeau, the coach that he knew him as a kid, right? He knew him as a kid when he was playing, when, uh, Tibbs was the assistant, was an assistant coach for the Knicks when, uh, Rick Brunson was a player for the Knicks. So like he's known him his whole life and he, he part partly wanted to play for Tibbs. And I think that buy-in that, that family affair Tibbs is like a, a, a adopted Knicks, uh, a, adopted Villanova coach, you know? Yeah. I mean, this Nova Knicks thing is really crazy. It feels like it's definitely going to be a 30 for 30. I, what's yes. a more likely 30 for 30 Bronny or, uh, Nova Knicks. Nova Knicks. Cause okay. Okay. The, this is no disrespect well, it, to Bronny. Well, I depends. hope he turns into a prospect. Well, it, but it, it depends on if if the Knicks win the championship this year, it'll definitely be the Nova Knicks. But what if the Lakers won a championship this year? Which is probably unlikely, but if they win the title this year because of Bronny. No, 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 no. That's the thing. No, 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 no. I'm just saying, you know, he plays a couple regular season games. Uh huh. And LeBron and AD get it done. You know what I mean? I, the, the, this is no disrespect to Bronny. I hope he has an outstanding NBA career. The much more Cinderella story is these guys winning a title in college and then winning the Knicks a title in the NBA together. That's that's just it's poetic being able to do that all as underdogs too. you know? Yeah. It's kind of a forgotten offseason move, but campaign was signed by the Knicks. You got to see Tyler Kolick in Summer League. I thought he was great. Everything you mentioned about the body language of the Knicks, this guy Tyler Ko- Kolick embodies the toughness, the feel for the game. I think he fits like a Tibbs team perfectly. Do you feel like he's the backup for Jalen Brunson at this point, or would you go with campaign? Like, how, how do you feel about the depth chart for the guard since we already went over the centers? If you believe the reporting... Uh, campaign is a depth piece. Like he's your 10th, 11th man. Mm. Uh, Tyler Kolick is the next man up. If they go to a 10th man right now, So you think he'll be getting rotation minutes right away. I think they're going to go nine deep to start this. Oh, okay. I think they're okay. going to go the, the five that Jalen Brunson, Steven, uh, Jalen Brunson, Mikael Bridges, Julius Randall, OG Ananobi, uh, Mitchell Robinson as your starting five with Deuce McBride, Josh Hart, DiVincenzo and Preston Achua as your back four, and they'll stagger, uh, which is the thing I'm most excited about is to see like the first time we see the Nova Knicks play together. And yeah, you know, the like Deuce McBride, a guy I'm still high on, he's back to playing like nine, he, 12 he, minutes a game. He, but... He's in, he's in every trade rumor, though. That's the thing about him because he's their, he's their most reasonable trade asset, like him right, and Mitch, right. right? Outside of Julius, who I think is going to get extended next week, but mm. um, the like Deuce, his contract is to a place where it's just understood. This is such an attractive asset and they're already nine deep and you did just draft Tyler Kolick. So if you do have trust in Kolick to play seven, eight minutes backing up Brunson, you can, you also have a veteran in campaign if you want to go that route and you know, you have insurance Deuce being in trade. I just think the reality of, of the, the contract Deuce signed is that it, this is this is an attractive asset to trade uh, if you have to. Um, as far as the rotation is concerned, I think they'll start out going nine deep. And look, Andrew, this is this is like the biggest lesson we all learned as Knicks fans last year. Mm-hmm. You can never have too many NBA players on your roster. 100%. I was sitting there in the middle of February watching Charlie Brown Jr. and Obi Toppin's little brother get rotation minutes because the Knicks were desecrated by injury. I, I watched them lose the game seven against the Pacers because like OG Ananobi was limping around and Josh Hart was tearing his abdomen and Jalen Brunson was breaking his hand and yeah, Robinson man. was already out for the series and Boyan Bogdanovich got cheap shotted against the Sixers. Like yeah. they were at critical mass when they suffered their first injury of the playoffs and then and they suffered four more. So I, I think the Knicks went into this year valuing the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th roster spot. 
And now there's guys I think could play for this team if they ever ever actually get to that point in the injuries that they need to go that go go that route, you know. You mentioned all those injuries, and they were playing so well right after the OG trade, and when everybody was still healthy, they were really looking like a true championship contender. January two thousand twenty three is like two thousand twenty four. Two thousand twenty four is one of my favorite months as a Knicks fan. They <laughs> looked like. I mean, they were 11 and one with Jalen Brunson, OG Ananobi on the floor. Mm-hmm. Uh, they were 12 and two right after the OG trade leading up to a Julius Randle injury. Um, I, I, was, I was riding high with that team. And then Randle got hurt on. A, I have no idea if it was a freak play or a dirty play. I know how a lot of Knicks fans feel about Jaime Hawkins Jr. Mm. But, you know, what well, it, it is what it is. And then. Before the next game, OG Ananobi is just like listed as questionable because his elbow hurts. And then a week later, we find out he had surgery. And it's like, oh, okay. So we're without both of them for the next, you know, couple months. And obviously, we haven't seen Julius return to the floor yet. Um, but January, they, I wanted to see what they look like against the Celtics, like that version of the Knicks. Yeah. And it's not even that I'm arrogant New Yorker that's like, we would have beaten them. I just wanted to see it. I just wanted to see what they look like against the Celtics. And unfortunately we didn't get to see it. Um, and I'm, I'm back there now. Like I'm not saying the Knicks are better than the Celtics. We'll beat the Celtics. I want to see what it looks like. I want to see what this new version of the team that I believe in looks like against the world champs now. All right. Two more things before we get out of here. Um, it's been sure. an interesting off season for the Knicks. Very good in a lot of ways. How would you grade it? The only issue is I hard had to go which was very unfortunate, but everything else seems really good. I mean, I guess you could point to the OG being a little injury riddled and paying them all kinds of money, but I, I like the idea of that, like, how would you grade this off season? Um, I don't look, there's nothing they could have done with Isaiah Hartenstein. They just, yeah. The moment OKC got involved, that's when I knew he was, he was leaving well, on the initial signing. They could have done something different, right? They could, like, but yeah. how did we know that a career backup was going to be worth more than two years, 16 million? You know? I, I don't know. Like, I'm not going to lie. When I, I see them in summer league, I loved them with the Rockets. I thought that guy was so good. I thought he was going to be a great backup center that could potentially take over. The yeah, starter he was role. so good. I didn't think league. he was going to make $30 million in two years though. Like that's the, the thing that Nick signed him. Yeah to too good of a contract and then he played too well and then That's a crazy. team with cap space that needed a center like i talked to our, our friend andrew schlecht over at the athletic that also mm-hmm. does thunder content he doesn't think he's gonna start like they oh, signed he's... 30 million dollars to a backup center he's not 100 percent sure he's gonna close well, why either. wouldn't it why wouldn't it be him and chet so chet's your starter jay yeah. will's your four and then you have you have four you have three spots which which jay will Guard J Dub, J Dub, J Dub. Okay, okay, okay. So play play this out for me. So you have five spots and for, for the starting five, right? Or even the closing five is a better, better conversation. Yeah. So Chet, J Dub, and SGA, no matter what. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you have two spots for Isaiah Hartenstein, Lou Dort, and Alex Caruso. A team that likes to play five out. Is I go gonna I- play a, a true center out there with Chet at the four guarding fours. I go I go Lou Dort off the bench. So he's not playing crunch time? Oh, I wouldn't necessarily. You got to go with matchups at that point. But so that's I, my point, though. Yeah, like, yeah, so yeah. maybe Hartenstein does start. Okay, and like, okay. Like maybe the politics is like, I, yeah, we brought I think, you here to start. We didn't bring yeah. you here to close. Yeah. But the talk out of OKC is we don't know that he wasn't guaranteed a starting spot. Is, it, what is this Dagenholt saying it or is this like the fans of OKC? This I mean, is I, the I, conversation I, I, I know, with people I know with Schle- press Schle- credentials. I mean, you know, Schleck so. is tapped in, so I know there's credence to what he's saying. So, yeah. I think the conversation around OKC was like we have – we, we we similar to how the Knicks have all this flexibility because they got Brunson on a discount. The Thunder hit gold in the lottery, not in the lottery, just like drafting most of their rotation. And so they're able to like trade Giddy and no picks for Caruso and just use cap space to sign Isaiah Hartenstein. Perfect. So, fit. They're just like, we need a backup. Yeah. Let's overpay yeah. for a backup center. We need another wing. Let's like give up Josh Giddy for Alex Caruso. So they they're in a place where they they're able to really like splurge a bit on someone that may they may not necessarily need more than 20 to 25 minutes a game. 
So, um, like the Hartenstein thing aside, I I think you have to give the Knicks like a solid BB plus. Okay. Um, time will tell if the loss of iHeart is more significant than, I mean, I believe it is. Uh, but I like I'm really excited about this team. They they the the wing defense that they're going to be able to put out there, the amount of just wings in general that they're going to be able to have out there next to Brunson, next to Randall is, is, is uh, exciting to think about. And I'm like, I'm really high in this team and you know, there's a world where this becomes an a plus off season. If all things break, right. Yeah. The bridges OG uh, tandem is going to be very fun defensively, right? That's going to mm-hmm. be tough. That's going to be tough for other teams. All right. If you could change one NBA rule, and I know you've talked about this before. Ah, we did just talk about this. Do I do my research, Andrew. I do my research. What would you change? Oh, man. Uh, so, I, so actually, we, my joke answer on the pod that you're referencing is that if at any point someone hits a half court shot, the game is tied. So if think oh, if teams were down by think if teams on, were down by 30, and all of a sudden, teams are just chucking up half court shots, and you're just okay. like you're you're having to guard it too. Uh, that was the, I, I'm not I, I'm half serious when I when I say that. Um, the hold on, okay, so I got this answer from a listener. Why not make the dunk worth three points, forcing teams to guard the paint? So, if you wanted to make dunks worth three, then rim protection becomes just as valuable as three point shooting. I like it, but the there's going to be so I, I like the idea of it. Actually, it's not bad, but they're going to be arguing about what's a dunk and what's not all the time. That's going to be annoying. That is fair. You'd have to yeah. fully define it. But think about it's it the bad. other way. There's less there's there's much more emphasis on like ball protection and like possessions. And this way, you're not allowing breakaways because a, a breakaway is now three points. Like turnovers yeah, become true. even it's more interesting. detrimental. It's you know, interesting. If you wanted yeah. to to make a dunk three points, that's the one that shout out to the Knicks Film School listeners that that suggested that. I'll, I'll Johnny Quest is his name. That's that was name. the one that got me thinking. You know is what? That, that's, is, is that his alias? That's a great name. It sounds like a superhero or something. You know what? I'll I'll say it's his alias because uh, if it's his real name, then I just doxed him. Um, but Johnny Quest, <laughs> you you commented and you left a really great suggestion on our YouTube channel, so I appreciate that. What I do want to see, no matter what the rule changes could be, I'd like to see some different rules in like the end season tournament. Mm. Like they had the different like courts. I, I want to see the four point line. Hey, Jeremy it's, Cohen it, would appreciate you. Okay. Oh, yeah. So go. it's similar to that. Yeah, no, nah, it's not similar to the half court thing. Cause just to be down 25 and then it gets tied is crazy. Tell me if a, if a team was down 10 with two minutes left, if they just didn't go into a half court offense. Literally a half court offense, like they're just taking half half court shots that you're not watching every game to see if they tie the game. It'd be it'd be fun. It'd be but, fun. It'd be ridiculous, but but it's not it's not really basketball at that point. But it'd still be fun. But it's fun. That's all I'm going for. It's fun at this point. You know. That's what it's all about, Andrew. Great stuff. It was great bumping into you in Vegas. It's always great having you on the show. Where can, where can we find you? Social media, everywhere else. You can find me on all my socials, Andrew J. Claudio underscore, and of course, anywhere you want to find Nick's Film School on on all the social medias uh, at uh, Nick Film School S K O O L. Uh, we're on YouTube. We're on your podcast feeds. We're on Patreon. We're on. Uh, Substack. If you want to subscribe to the Film School newsletter, please do. Uh, and Andrew, as always, it's good to talk to you, man. And thank you so much for having me. Anytime. Talk soon.